Is anybody here uh, willing to admit that you're a bit of a perfectionist? <laughs> and I, see, I see some hands going up. Um, so sometimes Andy gives me a hard time for being a bit of a perfectionist. And um, I, I've replied to him more than once that, 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 that I believe that everyone is a perfectionist in some way. Um, some of us, it's a little more all-encompassing of a worldview. Um, but all of us have certain things we like done a certain way. You may not care about getting the same things right that I do, but you know, maybe, uh, maybe you have a certain way you like to fold your laundry. You know, it, it, would anyone, if someone else folded your laundry and did it differently than you, anyone willing to admit that they, you'd probably refold the whole stack? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so maybe it's laundry, maybe it's not, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's how you load the dishwasher. If you've got a dishwasher, anyone, you've, you've, you've figured out what works, you know that this dish fits in this spot, and if you put it somewhere else, it's not going to get clean. Anyone have a particular way the dishes need to be loaded? Okay, so a few more hands. Uh, maybe it's not that. Maybe it's, maybe it's your garden and how meticulous you prune everything and pluck weeds. If you've seen my garden, you know I don't struggle with that. Um, maybe, it's your, maybe it's your appearance. Maybe before walking out the door, you've got to get your hair just right. You've got to you know, brush and floss and you know, do your makeup and pluck this and uh, adjust that. I don't know what it is for you. For, for others, it might be some aspect of your profession, you know, maybe you've got to sand the edge of the, the, the table just right, or you've got to get the, the formatting just right on the spreadsheet of numbers, you know, and if, it's, if, if the formatting is off, then it kind of ruins your day. You, you can't leave until you make it right. I think everyone is probably a perfectionist in some way with some aspect of their lives. I, I don't think I'm off the charts as a perfectionist. Uh, my world usually doesn't collapse if any little thing uh, is out of place, but I, I do strive to do things well. Unless I really don't have the time, I you know, tend to go through life. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. Um, in a certain way, I think that God is a perfectionist. And, and, and what, what I don't mean is he gets you know, irritable or angry or you know, spiteful if, if we don't do things exactly the way that, that he wants them done. We've got to arrange the Bibles this way or God gets upset. He's not that type of a perfectionist, um, but, but he's a perfectionist in that he's always working, he's always striving, he's always doing things in our lives to mold and shape us and purify, uh, purify us and refine us more and more into the image of his son. He never gives up. He never settles. You know, maybe, maybe some of you are quick to kind of go, yeah, it's as good as it's going to get. Might as well move on to the next thing. Uh, thankfully, God never does that. You know, though he might uh, look at me and say, you know, boy, I just don't know how I can improve, improve on that. But no, um, um, yeah, thankfully, God doesn't look at us and go, that's as good as I'm going to get with this one. Uh, that's, might as well throw in the towel. It's not getting any better from there. Just, he, he doesn't do that. God is always pursuing. He's always striving. He's always shaping, always sanding and polishing and, and working to make us more and more into the image of his son. Romans 8.28, a passage that has given hope and encouragement to millions of Christians throughout the centuries, uh, tells us that uh, Paul's writing, he says, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. That gives us hope. You know, it, in all things, God is working, he's orchestrating things in such a way that it is ultimately going to be for our good. But lest we not twist that into some kind of feel-good, warm, fuzzy, health, wealth, prosperity type of message. God is working everything so that you can be richer and healthier and safer. That's not what Paul is saying. Um, if you look at the context, I mean, the very next verse, he defines the good. He says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the good that God is seeking. He's working all things for good. What good? That you would be conformed into the image of his son. He, he, he's going to keep working until you reflect and shine uh, with the light of Jesus Christ more and more in your life. And as you look at the context of, of that passage in Romans 8, it's clear that, that God uses all kinds of things, like suffering and hardships and trials, as part of this pruning and refining process. 
He loves us enough to allow difficulties in our lives. Sometimes, uh, particularly when you've got a heart of compassion, tough love is difficult. Is it not? So, so you, you, you can be sucked into doing something that, that is enabling someone in their dependency. You're not teaching them to grow up. You're not teaching them to mature. You're just kind of fixing all their problems. And, and God loves us enough to do what's really good for us, even when it's hard. He, he's not a parent that coddles us and shields us from any little uh, thing that might come our way. We have a God that loves us enough to allow all kinds of things that might be hard, that we would rather avoid if we could, but that he uses together to shape us into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a process the Bible calls sanctification. It's not a once and done kind of thing. It's this ongoing, persistent work of sanctifying us, making us more holy, making us more Christ-like. I think that this is perhaps the dominant theme of the book of James. Uh, today, as you might have guessed, uh, starting with chapter 1, verse 1, we're beginning uh, a series in the book of James that will lead us through uh, this fall. And, and James is an incredible book. Uh, it's, it's, just, I, it's always been a favorite of mine. It's a practical, down-to-earth book. And we get a little bit of a glimpse of who the author is and what his aim is in the opening verse, in verse 1. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nation's greetings. Uh, James, like Paul, if you've read uh, very many of his letters, uh, James identifies himself first and foremost as a servant, uh, more literally a slave of God and of Jesus Christ. And for the skeptics in this room, and I'd imagine in a room this size, there's some here that are kind of on the fence with this whole Christianity thing and what to make of, of Jesus. And this, this opening line should shock you. Uh, it, it should rattle you a little bit and kind of get your attention because James is Jesus' younger half-brother. Um, other passages in Scripture uh, make that clear. Um, the, 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 this James grew up in the household with Jesus. And I don't know about you, but if my older brother told me he was the son of God, forgive me, but I would be a little skeptical. Uh, I'd, I'd be an unbeliever. And the scriptures tell us, if you read through the Gospels, uh, Jesus' family, his siblings, his brothers were unbelievers. They, they were skeptical uh, that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the son of God. They're like, yeah, right. Him? No, 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 not a chance. You know, like, not, not because they saw sin in him, but just, he's your brother. Like, what do you mean you're the son of God? Like, you know, James was a skeptic, uh, to say the least, but after Jesus' death and resurrection, James was powerfully persuaded that Jesus was who he said he was, that, that he was the Messiah that for thousands of years Jews have been longing for and waiting for. You know, what would it take for you to believe that your brother was the son of God? It would take something big, right? Like, I'm, I'm not going to be pushed over with some, like, little you speak good. Oh, that was, that was a really, really great message you gave there. You must be God's son. No, no, you've got to really go over the top, you know, if, if you're going to believe that your sibling is the Messiah. But that's exactly what happened with James. He was so convinced of Jesus' divine origin and mission that he gave the rest of his life to pastoring Jesus' followers. So much so that he considered himself a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That word Lord means master, sovereign. James saw who his brother was. He saw who Jesus was and said, I'm, I'm under him. I'm submitting to him. He's my sovereign. He's my Lord. So James uh, he, he was with the disciples. Uh, the beginning of the book of Acts tells us that he was um, with the, the women and the disciples in the upper room as they anticipated um, the, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. He was there at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down in power. He was there from, from day one. He was there when Peter preached this incredible sermon and thousands uh, trusted in Jesus Christ. And very early on, G, uh, James rose to uh, leadership in the Jerusalem church. Uh, the Jerusalem church would have been made up of that 
you know, first batch of believers as Peter preached, along with some of others uh, of Jesus' followers from his ministry. And as the word spread and more Jews began to trust in Christ, James became essentially the senior pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And something, uh, the book of Acts tells us that something catastrophic happened to his church. Uh, I wonder what would happen here and what it would be like for me if as the pastor, uh, you know, and, and leading this church, if we faced what, what the church in Jerusalem faced. But uh, Acts chapter 3 records this. It says, um, it des- chapter 7 describes the martyrdom of Stephen. Uh, Paul was a part of this before he became a believer um, called Saul, and, and he's, you know, going door to door, persecuting, harassing, um, and, and, and kind of leading this, you know, killing of Stephen. They stone him, and uh, Acts chapter 8, 1 to 3 reads this. It says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So James is the pastor of this church that is being persecuted, this church that is now scattered. Uh, the, the vast majority of his congregation is on the run. They're, they're looking for other places in the Roman Empire where they can find a home without, being, uh, their, without having their lives threatened, without being thrown in jail, without someone like Saul from Damascus chasing them down. And so he, he's got this scattered church. And, and of course, the, the apostles and him continue to minister, and God continues to raise up and draw to himself believers in Jerusalem. But you can imagine, as a pastor, having to see most of your flock scatter because of persecution, that you feel that. It, it, it hurts as a pastor when people go through situations like that, and he sees this scattered church, and he essentially writes this letter kind of a sermon um, in letter form, essentially. He writes this letter expecting it to get passed around to uh, some of his congregants, some of his parishioners that have been scattered because of persecution. And the major theme in the book of James is maturity, completeness, perfection, us, as I described earlier, growing into the likeness of Christ. Uh, five times in James, we see this uh, Greek word teleos, uh, which refers to our growth in maturity or completion or perfection. Um, we, we see it in verse 4 that we would be uh, mature and complete, not lacking anything. Um, that it will, throughout the book of James, this keeps coming up, um, that, 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 that James wants to see his people, even in their persecution, even in their hardship and trials, and it's clear, as as we'll read through James, that a lot of his people were incredibly poor. They had just so many difficult circumstances to work through, Um, but, but he's writing to encourage, and in the midst of all the hardship, he wants to see them grow in maturity. He wants to see them not just complain and bemoan their situation, but, but, but to, to move past it, to overcome it. Um, that that they would grow more and more into the likeness of Christ. James understands that God shows us his grace. God saves us not so that we can just sit where we are and keep doing and living life the way that we always have, but he saves us to redirect us, to transform us, to give us a new purpose, to give us a new hope, to give us new direction. Uh, He loves us. God loves us as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us as we are. Uh, And any any church saying, oh, God just loves you as you are. You're you're welcome here. Like, yes, you're welcome here. But if that's the only message you get, if you don't get the second half of that, that God loves you too much to leave you as you are, then you're getting half the message. And James is the second half of that message. Saying, yes, God loves you, but he loves you too much to leave you in your sin, to leave you in your addiction, to leave you in your selfishness. God is doing all kinds of different things to shape you and mold you and grow you and mature you. God is always working on this process of perfecting 
and maturing us. And, and because James gets that, because that's his driving concern, James is an incredibly practical book. Uh, anyone seen those? There's a series of books, Idiot's Guide to, you know, fill in the blank, Idiot's Guide to Windows Vista, Idiot's Guide to uh, the NFL, Idiot's Guide to, you know, whatever. And, uh, and there's a sense in which James is the idiot's guide to Christian living. You know, and, and, and we need that sometimes. Those books can be handy. And, and James is just making it simple. He's making it practical. This is what it looks like to grow in faith, to grow more like Jesus Christ. In this situation, in this situation, he covers all kinds of practical things. And it's kind of a rapid-fire succession. We're used to, you know, at least if, if you've been in Calvary very long, we, we've preached through a number of the, the letters of Paul. And if you're familiar with Paul, typically starts off very instructional, very, you know, he's teaching, he's kind of laying foundation, and then he'll get to a certain point in his letters where he turns to application. Now that you understand who you are in Christ, now that you understand what Jesus has done for you, this is how you live it out. And with James, like, verse 1 is introduction, verse 2 is application. Like, he just goes straight to how do you live this out? And so, you know, I'm, sometimes I, I, I need that Anyone else? Sometimes you just be straight with me. Just kind of tell me what to do. Sometimes we need some simple, straightforward direction. And so you might uh, find yourself resonating with James in that. I think we need sections of Scripture like this. So in verse 2, he jumps uh, right into it. And, and he gives us what I would describe is, is one crazy command. It starts off with an imperative and by all accounts, it's, it's kind of a crazy command. He gives us, right from the get-go, a crazy command, and he follows it by a two-step explanation. His crazy command is this, that we would consider trials to be joy. That we would consider trials, hardships, difficult, painful, unfortunate circumstances, that we would consider them to be joy. It's kind of a crazy command. I, I want to make sure we understand it uh, fully here before we go on to his explanation for it, but, but he says, consider it pure joy. The word consider in Greek is an interesting word. Um, it, it can have two primary meanings. Uh, when it's referring to people, it can mean to lead or to guide or even to govern. Um, so so, so this, this word, uh, leading, guiding, overseeing, governing, um, but so, so the act of supervising, directing someone else's behavior. But the word can also be used with a reference to the mind, and, and it can mean to think or to consider or to reckon. And at first glance, I remember looking at that, like these seem like two very different meanings to a word, you know, to lead, to guide, to govern, to think, to reckon, to consider. Um, and, and, and tell what you, when you think about it more, it begins to, to come together. Um, if you're a manager, supervising work, you, you have oversight over some employees, and uh, anyone here been in, a, in an oversight capacity at some point, you've been an employer or a manager, supervisor, um, well, if you have people under you, you know that, that oftentimes their default behavior is not productivity, right? You know, left to their own uh, ways, you know, if you kind of go into the back room and take a nap, you know, odds are you come back five hours later, they're not going to be at the peak of productivity doing exactly what you want. You know, they, they need guidance. They need direction. They need oversight to keep focused on what they need to focus on, to be doing what they need to be doing, that, that they need help to keep them from going astray. And the same thing is true of our minds. And anyone willing to admit that, you know, if, you, if you're just kind of on autopilot, your mind can scatter in all kinds of different directions, you know, that, that it, naturally it isn't always your most common habit to just be Godward, focused on Him, you know, like all the time. Like, I just know my, my brain can be scattered. I can be all over the place, and my brain takes some governing. You know, I, I can't be passive with my own thought life. Um, I, I need to take ownership. Sometimes I need to grab my brain, you know, by the harness like a horse and like, this is where we're going. You know, come on, come on, focus. You know, if you ever, ever try to have prayer for more than 30 seconds, you know, you've had to struggle with this. You know, no, come on, get back. Here, this is what we're praying about. 
oh, come on, back. You know, you, 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 you're looking down, and all of a sudden you see stuff in the carpet. I should vacuum, you know, or... You know, you, 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 you happen to look at your watch, and, oh, is that the time? Well, I've got this coming up. And our brain can go in all kinds of different directions, and it takes some focus to focus. It takes some effort, some energy to direct our minds. And so this word, whether we're talking about people or whether talking about our brains, it means we're taking ownership in directing our thoughts, our energies on what they should be focused on. And that's, that's what James is getting at when he says consider. Because we don't naturally consider trials to be joy, do we? You know, when, when you stub your toe, I, I'd imagine most of us, our default reaction is not, praise the Lord, what a, what a wonderful thing, you know. Most of us would, you know, you know or uh, have some things you wouldn't want repeated from the pulpit um, come out of your mouth. It, 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 there, there can be, you know, our automatic default reaction when frustrations come, when traffic is nuts, uh, you're not, oh, bless you, bless you. Um, you know, when someone cuts you off in traffic, that's not always the automatic response. Uh, I remember being with someone, um, I was in the passenger seat, uh, pulled into a parking lot, and someone just darted in front of them, took the spot that he was obviously aimed for, uh, aiming towards, and he goes, bless you, and he pulled out, and we didn't get coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. I was like, whoa, you know, like, I was, I was just so blown away that his automatic response in that moment was, was to bless them. If I'm being honest, that's not always my automatic response. I need to do what James is saying, that to, to take something that I would automatically think a different way. I'd get angry, I'd get frustrated, I'd get discouraged, I'd get disappointed, whatever it might be. And James is saying, no, reel in, you know, control the horse, rein in the horse. And this is what I want you to think about in these moments. Consider them to be joy. Consider them to be joy. And he says, all, interesting description. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I, I, James, is, he recognizes that, that there are all kinds of things that get in our way. All kinds of things that don't go the way that we wanted. Um, you know, obviously, as we get through James, we'll see persecution, we'll see poverty as being some of the main trials that they're going through. But, but he doesn't limit it to that, because he knows that you know, it, it can be physical ailments that just, you know, our body doesn't work the way that we want it to, and it's frustrating, and it's painful, and we wish it would just go away, or this person isn't treating us the way that we would want to, and it's frustrating, and we wish they would go away, or whatever it might be. Um, you know, things don't go the way that you want. You don't always get paid what you want. You don't always get the job that you want, the situation that you want, the apartment that you want, whatever it might be. There are you know, from, from little things to big things, life is full of trials. Life is full of things not going the way that we want. And he says in this whole kind of diversity of trials that may come our way, we're to consider them joy. The NIV says pure joy. It's, it's translating what is literally all joy. Consider it all joy. And I think the NIV gets it right. I don't think the all is meant to be uh, you know, refer to exclusivity, like you should feel nothing but joy, but it's talking about the intensity of the emotion. You should feel sincere, legitimate joy, pure joy. Not that that's the only emotion that you feel. Uh, James recognizes that, 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 you know, that we can't, like, not have some, you know, inklings of disappointment or sadness or frustration or, or whatever, but there's this mingling sometimes of of the difficulty of the trial, the, the fact, you know, you might have a loved one that passes away, and it's not like we're supposed to be, you know, like bouncing and, and cheerful, but even in that sorrow, even in that bereavement, even in that moment of pain and heartache, there is a joy that we can have as we rest on and, and delight in whose we are and who we can trust, that we have a sovereign God who is orchestrating things in such a way that, that even though we can't figure out how it's all going to make sense in his big kind of portrait that he's painting, we can trust that he's up to something. Um, and and that, that peace can give us joy in the midst of whatever it is that we're facing. But it's not automatic. We need to consider it joy. We need to go against our natural inclination to choose to direct our minds to the fact that God is doing something in this. 
Even if we can't see it, we can trust him. So the crazy command is consider trials to be joy. Step one of the explanation is that testing produces toughness. The reason that we should consider trials to be joy is because testing produces toughness. Look at verse 3. He says, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. The testing of your faith develops perseverance. A testing is a a unique word in, in Greek. It's rarely used one other time in the New Testament, only twice in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That's a very specific word that refers to the process of refining gold and silver and precious metals. Um, you, you, you take those, you put them in a pot of intense heat, and as the, the dross, the impurities rise to the surface, they can be skimmed off, and this metal can be purified, removed of alloys and mixtures, can become pure, really, until, until the blacksmith looking into this pot of molten silver, for example, can see his reflection in it. That's essentially what they're doing, is they're, they're stripping away these impurities as the, as the metal is heated. I can't help but think that that is a, a perfect description of suffering. Is it not suffering that makes our impurities rise to the surface? You know, the, the majority of the time, uh, I don't believe that it's, uh, it's suffering or hardships that causes marriages to break up or families to break up or our spiritual lives to break up. Suffering most of the time doesn't cause the problems but reveals the problems. Have you ever gone to a doctor for a stress test? Anyone? I'm, I'm, I'm young enough. I haven't uh, done this. I've, I've heard my dad describe it often enough. But, uh, you know, they put you on a treadmill or elliptical machine or something to get the, the heart going. You know, you're, you're, you're walking, you're running, you're you're pumping the arm things or whatever it is to get your heart rate up. Why do they do that? Why don't they just sit you on a chair, listen to your heart? Yep, sounds good. You're okay. Why? Because there are things revealed when you're stressed that are not revealed when you're sitting there relaxed, right? You know, you, you, your heart might sound fine when you're hanging out, you know, sipping on a cup of coffee, but, but you get the blood pumping, you get moving, get 20 minutes of heavy sweating and exercise in and all of a sudden someone listens to your heart watch your ekg or whatever it is and there are things that are revealed in that stress that are hidden and masked at other times you know like a picture of an 18 wheeler going over a bridge you know a bridge might have thousands of little hairline cracks and you go over on your bicycle it's not going to reveal anything maybe your car probably wouldn't notice anything but an 18 wheeler goes over a bridge like that it might collapse because there are, not because it, it's creating the problem, it's simply revealing the problems that are there. I think stress can do that. It, it can expose problems. It can do that in our marriages. You can think your marriage is going well, and it might just be because life is easy right now. It might just be because the finances are there, and the vacations are happening, and the kids are obedient, or off at college somewhere, or, you know, whatever. It, it might just be that, you know, you're in kind of a pleasant season, and there's not much stress in your life, and it can, you know, I'll, I'll take some more of those. I'm not saying that it's bad to have seasons like that, um, but, but it can make you think that things are fine when they're really not. And often it's the seasons of comfort that can slowly erode our relationships. You start taking each other for granted. You stop working on things and being deliberate about, we need to talk, we need to focus, we need to seek the Lord together, whatever it might be. And, and even aside from marriages and other relationships, think of your relationship with God. How, how often do you slip into spiritual laziness and passivity when you're in a pleasant season of life? When everything's going your well, you stop crying out to God. Your prayer life can often uh, wane and fade. You can get, get lax with church attendance and Bible reading and stuff like that because, because life is, it's summer and the beach is so uh, great and we can do all these things and all of a sudden God gets pushed further and further aside. And you might think that your relationship with God is good, but wait till a trial comes your way. 
Wait till some hardship comes your way, and, and suffering has a way of exposing what's really going on. It might cause some problems, but I think 80% or more of the time, it simply reveals what's there. The, the dross rises to the surface in the midst of the heat of suffering. And yet, suffering also has a way of, not only does it reveal the problems, but suffering has a way of cleaning that dross off. Suffering, it doesn't always do it. We're, we're a part of this process, as we'll see uh, in just a second, but, but stress, you know, if you go to a stress test at the doctor, it can reveal problems, but, but if you get on a treadmill, you know, the 20 minutes that might have been the stress test, do that three times a week for the next six months, and my guess is, is that that stress test has now become an exercise regimen that helps to resolve the issue that was first revealed, right? Stress has a way of strengthening things, just like muscles get stronger by opposition and resistance. So we grow as trials refine and strengthen us. The fire of trials expose what's wrong. They expose our idols, our false loves, the little gods that we create. And, and if that's the case, when, when suffering comes your way, you'll get angry at God. You'll get angry in general. If, if, if you you have a false god of control and you're in a situation where you have no control, that idol will become exposed and you'll be angry that you can't have the thing that you want. Or if, uh, you know, whatever that, that might be, whether it's control, whether it's your reputation and all of a sudden your reputation is being damaged, that idol is exposed. Maybe comfort and ease is your idol and, and that gets exposed. Suffering exposes things um, but, it, but it can also expose and refine and strengthen our love for God. We, we just finished a series, a four-week series in the book of Habakkuk, tail end of your Old Testament. And I love that book, and, and if you weren't here for it, I encourage you to go online and listen to some of those sermons because Habakkuk was struggling. He saw violence and evil and suffering all around him, and he was doubting. He had a lot of questions about God and God, where are you in this? And God, why do you seem like you're on vacation? Why aren't you showing up? He's frustrated. He's angry. And yet, that, that anger doesn't push him away from God, but it draws him closer to God, right? It, it, that the suffering for him revealed that God was his ultimate treasure. You know, he, he, he was hurt. He was suffering. He was, it was a difficult time, but he clung all the tighter to God in the midst of it. And therefore, the suffering for him exposed who his true God was, and it was the real God. It might not do that for you. It might expose some idols in your life. It might reveal where your heart is at. But God, in his grace, not only uses suffering to reveal, but to refine, to strengthen, to purify, so that we grow to trust in him, grow to rely on him, grow to look at him more and more. It says, the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance. Uh, that word in Greek means to, to, to remain under. Is the, the etymology is how we get it. Uh, the word, the, the pieces uh, making up the word mean to remain under. And the picture is of a, of a person carrying a heavy load. And to persevere means to remain under the load, to not give up and drop it but you're persevering, you're shouldering the weight, you're remaining under the load even though it's tiring, even though it's hard, even though you want to throw in the towel and walk away. Perseverance is the ability to remain under the weight without giving up. You remain under the load, you persevere. And, uh, and that's, we, we need that muscle to be strengthened. Uh, that, that's not automatic. If you've ever been on a road trip with kids, what's the phrase you're bound to hear on a road trip with children? Anyone? Are we there yet? You know, I've, I've heard that. My kids are four and two. I've heard that uh, enough already, and I'm sure the, the frequency will only go up with road trips in the future. Uh, are we there yet? And it's because kids don't have an appreciation for the journey. It's just all about the destination. They're impatient. You know, I want to get there. I want to be there. I don't like this whole thing that we've got to sit here for hours and hours and hours um, while we're, we're getting there. Um, they, they don't appreciate the journey or recognize the importance of 
the journey. And, and that, that journey is, is difficult sometimes. It's frustrating. It's, you know, painful. Let's get there already. But the journey takes time. As parents, it can be tempting to, to want to shield our children from anything frustrating, difficult, painful, disappointing. Uh, maybe you're familiar with the term helicopter parent. A- anyone heard that term before? Helicopter parent. You know, the kind of parent that, you know, like a helicopter, you're kind of hovering over your child. You know, anytime they might stub their toe, you dive in and, oh, no, 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 not that. Um, a- a- anytime there's any hint of, of difficulty for them, oh, no, and you swoop in and you come to their rescue and, oh, no, my poor child almost you know, had a toy taken away from them, um, you know, whatever it might be. That it, it, you can, helico- it, it's tempting at times to be a helicopter parent, and yet um, we, you, can, you can so inhibit the growth and maturity of your child if you never let them experience hardship. Now, obviously, I'm not promoting, like, you know, you playing Candy Crush on your iPhone while your kids play in the street, you know, Go, take the chalk, you know, color something for daddy, um, you know, and you just, they're playing. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not promoting that kind of passivity and laziness as parenting or recklessness, um, but, but somewhere in between, you know, this, this passive nothing and this helicopter doing everything is this healthy willingness to let them go through things that will strengthen them. It'll be difficult. It'll be painful. They don't always get what they want, but you get a child that's mature, that's able to handle hardship in life, and as I alluded to earlier, God does that with us. He knows that the testing of our faith develops perseverance. It strengthens this muscle of toughness that allows us to stick to it, to endure, to continue under the weight where others might give up. That muscle has been flexed because God loves us enough to let some unfortunate things happen in our lives. So the crazy command is that we should consider uh, trials to be joy. The first part of the explanation is that the testing produces toughness. But, but toughness isn't the final goal. Uh, when, when, when faith is tested, the immediate result is, or should be, perseverance, toughness. But as valuable as that is, that's not the end game. That's not the final thing that God is working towards. He, he wants that to finish its work. Look at verse 4. It says, Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So the second step of this explanation for why we should consider trials to be joy, not only does testing produce toughness, but toughness leads to maturity. Toughness leads to maturity. The NIV doesn't quite get this right. At the beginning of verse 4, uh, at least the, the 84 NIV says, perseverance must finish its work. Finish its work. Um, the, the, and 2011, there was an updated NIV. It fixed it to match what most modern translations have, uh, which says, let perseverance finish its work. I think that's an important distinction. Rather than perseverance must finish its work, to say, let perseverance finish its work. Because we're, we're not passive in this. It's not automatic. Perse- or that um, trials don't always produce perseverance and perseverance doesn't always finish its work. We are a part of this process and the command here is for us to let this, to participate with this, to be on board with perseverance working itself out in maturity. We welcome this refining process through the trial and as I said before, that maturity ultimately is Christ-likeness. I've heard a phrase a number of times in recent years, often in pre-marriage counseling. I do a fair bit of pre-marriage counseling. Just officiated a wedding yesterday for Phil and Kristen Harlov, um, which was exciting. But uh, I do, do a, a fair bit of pre-marriage counseling. And one of the questions that I ask in the first session of every uh, pre-marriage counseling um, session, you know, group with a or time with a couple, uh, one of the first questions I ask is, why do you want to get married? And a phrase that I've heard more and more in recent years, which has almost become a cliche, is um, that they, they help to make me the best version of myself. 
You know, I, I'm sure there's some romantic comedies that have used, used that line at the climax, you know, when, when it, all the trial gets resolved and, oh, they make me a better version of me. And that's a good thing, right? Like, I'm, I don't want to knock that, you know, that's, like, that's a good thing to be the best version of you, but, but often what people mean by that is, you know, it, it, they help, they, they support me being the me that I most want to be or that I feel like being. Um, the best version of you is Jesus Christ. Let me just put it that way. You know, the, the, the best, if they're really helping you to be the best version of you, they're helping you to be like Jesus Christ. And if you're just patting yourself, oh, you know, this is, I like this relationship. I like this person. They help me to be the best version of me. You know, they, they help me to be better at my video games and support me in my, you know, binge watching of Netflix. And they, you know, they really come alongside me and help me to do whatever I most feel like doing. Like that, if, if, if that's, you know, as I poke and prod in these counseling sessions, if that's what comes out, let's put the brakes on. Let's talk about this. Um, because the best version of you is Jesus Christ. And that's the work that God is doing. When, when James here says that, that perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When we look on, you know, the people on planet Earth, who is mature and complete, not lacking anything? Jesus Christ. He's the only perfect example we have. Um, it, we, we've got to look to him. And yes, it's great when we've got some godly role models that kind of show us in some ways what that looks like, but we lower the bar if we set our focus on anyone other than Jesus Christ. He is the best version of us that God wants to keep persistently moving us towards. But it's hard to see that when you're in the midst of difficulty. It's hard to see that. It's hard to value that. When you lose your job, when you don't know where you're going to get the money to pay the bills, when your marriage is falling apart and your kids hate you and, and everything, you know, weeds are in your garden and all the, you know, all these things, when everything is, is going wrong, it's hard to say God is up to something. It's hard to say, you know, I should consider this joy because God is teaching me. He's molding me. He's shaping me. It's hard to see that in the midst of difficulty. Max Licato, uh, or Licato in his book, The Eye of the Storm, uh, writes this. He says, Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. One second he was peacefully perched in his cage, the next he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. The problems began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage. The phone rang and she turned to pick it up. She'd barely said hello when Chippy got sucked in. The bird owner gasped, put down the phone, turned off the vacuum and opened the bag and there was Chippy, still alive but stunned. Since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him, raced him to the bathroom, turned on the faucet and held Chippy under the running water. Then realizing that Chippy was soaked and shivering, she decided she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for the hair dryer and blasted the pet with hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma, the reporter who had initially written about the event uh, contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. It's hard not to see why sucked in, washed up, and blown over. It's enough to steal the song from the stoutest heart. Um, I think that's a picture of how some of you might feel today. Sucked up, um, blown over, washed up and blown over, that it's easy to be worn out. It's easy to just get frustrated, get angry, get disappointed with trials. It's not our natural default mode to rejoice. And yet, God is up to something. And you can trust him that in the midst of the vacuum cleaner and sink and blow dryer of life, to trust that God is working to mold you and shape you more into the likeness of his son. And you can fight that, you can avoid that, you can run away from that, or you can welcome that and praise him from that, uh, for that, because that's the God that we have. Now let's pray together.
Now, Father God, I suspect that there are some in our midst today that need some encouragement, that need a reminder that you haven't forgotten about them, that you are present with them, uh, that you are sovereign over their situation and trial. Um, God, that you have a purpose in it, and you're working to accomplish something through it, and ultimately you're not giving up till we shine with your light, till we reflect your character, till people see Jesus in us. As I look at my, lo- my own life, I shudder at what suffering you might bring my way for how far I still have to go. And yet all of us fall short. God, thank you for your mercy and your grace and knowing what we can handle. Help us to not get frustrated when we realize that you think we can handle more than we think we can. But God, help us to persevere. Help us to bear under the weight that you've allowed to come our way. Help us to see what you're doing in the midst of it. Help us to live surrendered lives, welcoming, even thanking and praising you for the trials that come our way, that you might shape us to be more like Christ. Help us. In your name we pray. Amen.